Good morning, my name is Jim Campbell and it's my privilege to welcome you to Brisbane Evangelical Church this morning. Our church is situated in Largs in North Ayrshire on the Firth of Clyde. And today we're going to continue with the theme of the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. And we're going to start with a hymn. It's an old hymn that was written by Thomas Kelly. The head that once was crowned with thorns is crowned with glory now. We're going to sing it, however, to a tune different to the one that's usually associated with the hymn. It's a catchy tune, one I'm sure that you'll be able to pick up quickly and you can sing along with. Sometimes when we hear a hymn to a new tune, it refreshes the words to us and makes them new. I hope that will be the case this morning. The head that once was crowned with thorns is crowned with glory now.
Let's come before the Lord in prayer. Shall we pray? Our God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for the hope you have placed in our hearts and for the assurance that is ours through the Easter message. We worship and honour your name, praise your character, and rejoice in your love and grace. We remember the words of the psalmist, the joy of the Lord is my strength. And your hope has brought joy into our hearts, a joy that we can know in trouble, a miraculous joy that comes from your salvation and your presence. You are the joy of all who dwell above, the joy of all below, to whom Lord manifests his love and grants his name to know. And we thank you for the day when we came to know your love and know your name it's all, in all its meaning, Jesus, Saviour, Lord and Friend. And today we rest secure in your hands. We give thanks that our Redeemer lives and reigns on high, the crown of thorns replaced by a crown of glory. You have taken humanity to the heights of heaven with your perfect humanity there to prepare a place for us. And so today we come before you to pray for our world, our community, our families and ourselves. You know our needs, our fears and our problems. Grant us your forgiveness and your grace, your peace and your strength to be able to lean on your everlasting arms and on your promises. And so, so we pray that you might be with us today as we continue in your presence in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. The Apostle Paul wrote to the Christians in the ancient city of Colossae, and he spoke to them of Christ in you, the hope of glory. The thought is of the living Christ living in us and working through us. And that's the theme of the next song we're going to hear. It's sung by a Christian musical group called Sila, and it's called Yet Not I, But Christ in Me. of grace is Jesus my Redeemer there is no more for heaven now to give he is my joy my righteousness and freedom my steadfast love my deep and boundless peace to this I hold
but through Christ in me. We are fortunate to have in our church Ronnie and Margaret Sim. Ronnie and Margaret work with the Wycliffe Bible translators, translating the Bible into different languages across the globe. It's a very difficult and painstaking task, and one that takes a lot of time. What may seem a, a, an ordinary phrase that could be translated literally often has difficulties in being understood in another culture, and so they have to think of ways around that. Ronnie's now, now going to bring us a video that explains some of the problems they experience in Bible translation. In both Matthew and Luke, after Jesus' familiar words, ask and you shall find, knock and it shall be opened for you, Jesus follows up with some examples. If I combine the two Gospels for a moment, we get the words, which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? Three questions, each presenting alternatives. They don't say the obvious obvious to most of us at least. They're about food and eating. And about a child asking a parent for food which he wants to eat. Bread, fish, egg. And the alternatives are not food. A stone, a snake, a scorpion. At least these assumptions are obvious to most of us, but it's not obvious to everyone across the world. In some places, people don't eat eggs. After all, remember what an egg is, an unfertilized ovum of a bird. You can see why people avoid them. Who would eat it? In some places, neither fish nor snake is food. In other places, a snake might be better than fish. A snake's liver and heart stretches along the inside of the snake, so if you grill it and slice it up, and share it, everyone gets a bit of heart, a bit of liver, and a bit of meat. Yum. Translators who meet these awkwardnesses have to solve them. They're in the context of the culture that's receiving scripture. That leaves one more, bread. Surely everyone has bread, not as we know it. To have bread, you need wheat or barley or some similar grain. Not everyone has these. And so we would be looking for an acceptable substitute, another staple in these different cultures. This short, simple illustration of Jesus depends on unspoken examples about food in the local context. We're now going to have a, another hymn, a hymn that tells us how God can reveal his truth to us through his word. It's a hymn that's called, Open my eyes that I might see glimpses of truth thou hast for me. It's sung for us today by the Fountain View Academy, which is a school in British Columbia in Canada, although they're singing the hymn uh, on location in California. Open my eyes that I may see. Open my eyes that I may see Glimpses of truth Thou hast for me Place in my hands the wonderful key That shall unclasp and set me free Silently now I wait for Thee Ready, my God, Thy will to see Open my eyes of 
truth thou sendest clear. And while the wave notes fall on my ear, everything false will disappear. Silently now I wait for thee, ready, my God, thy will to see. Open my ears, illumine me, Spirit divine. Open my mouth and let me bear, gladly the warm truth everywhere. Open my heart and let me prepare, love with thy children. My God, thy will to see, open my heart, illumine me, Spirit divine. Three times I was beaten with rods, once I was pelted with stones, three times I was shipwrecked, and once I was adrift at sea for a day and a night. I have travelled many weary miles. I have faced dangers from floods and from robbers. Now, I could only claim one of these. I've been adrift at sea for a few hours in a boat that has broken down. But of course, it's the Apostle Paul who is actually speaking here. And he's writing of the trials he's experienced as he journeyed about the Roman world of his day proclaiming the gospel to different people in different places. One of his shipwrecks occurred on the island of Malta. He was on his way to Rome to face trial. They had let, set out late towards the winter. There was a storm and they were shipwrecked on Malta. If I had been Paul, I might have been saying, Lord, could you not have granted me a few peaceful days at sea and a nice sea voyage to Rome in order to prepare for what lies ahead. But Paul doesn't say that. Paul's trust and confidence was in the Lord. He believed in God's will and God's purpose. Towards the end of his life, he wrote, I know the one in whom I trust, and I'm sure he's able to guard what I have entrusted to him against that day. That's the day of his return. Paul's confidence in the Lord never wavered. Why was that? I would suggest it was because he had met the living Lord Jesus Christ. He was convinced of his resurrection from the dead. He was assured of the truth of the gospel, and he desperately wanted to proclaim that gospel to other people so they might know the truth and the hope of it as well. And so, in writing to the Corinthians, the believers in the church in Corinth, he presents his evidence for the resurrection and proclaims, as we heard Gordon say last week, how it's central to the Christian faith. It wasn't that the Christians in Corinth had ceased to believe in the resurrection. They had, however, been influenced by people who said that it wasn't a bodily resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. It was a kind of ghostly figure, a spectre, that they were viewing. And Paul writes to correct this and to assure them of the bodily resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the evidence that Paul presents to the Corinthians and elsewhere, we can use as evidence of the resurrection in the sceptical age in which we live. Paul presents three pieces of evidence. First, there's the evidence of Scripture. Secondly, there's the evidence of eyewitnesses. And thirdly, Paul's own experience of meeting with the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's look first at the evidence of Scripture. Paul writes, Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture. He was buried and rose again according to the Scriptures. He lays the emphasis on these events being in accordance with the scripture. And I think here the scripture that Paul is referring to is the Old Testament as we would describe it. 
written hundreds of years before the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ, which prophesied things about his birth, his life, his death, and his resurrection. The Jewish people, of course, looked for the Messiah, the Christ, and recognized that there were prophecies about him in the Bible. Christians believe that these prophecies were fulfilled in the life, death, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus. I think the first point to note is that there were two seemingly conflicting sets of prophecies about the Messiah. There were those that described his triumph and his never-ending reign in glory and majesty. And there were those that described quite the opposite. He's a man of sorrows. He's rejected by the people and he's put to death. Clearly, there was a problem in reconciling these two sets of prophecy. For the Messiah to reign first and then be rejected would seem pointless. How would that fit into God's plan? And the reverse seemed impossible as well. How could the Christ triumph after death? Some thought there could be two Messiahs, each fulfilling a different set of prophecies. Of course, with hindsight, we can see how the resurrection reconciles these two sets of prophecies, a rejection followed by a triumphant resurrection from the dead. Let's look at some of the prophecies that we find contained in the Bible, in the Old Testament, written hundreds of years before Jesus was born. Psalm 41 tells us Jesus would be betrayed by a friend with whom he took bread, with whom he broke bread. And of course, that was fulfilled by Judas. Zechariah reveals that Jesus would be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. Isaiah tells us Jesus would be spat upon and beaten. Isaiah also goes on to say Jesus would be killed, although he remained silent before his accusers. Isaiah wrote, He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. Psalm 22 describes the cross. Jesus spoke the op opening words of this psalm from the cross when he said, My God, why have you forsaken me? The psalm goes on to say, I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue clings to my jaws. You have brought me to the dust of death. They pierce my hands and my feet. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. This is a description of the crucifixion and also of the behavior of the soldiers at the cross when Jesus was crucified. Isaiah tells us Jesus would die like a criminal, but be buried in a rich man's tomb. He was assigned a grave with the wicked, he wrote, and with the rich in his death. The latter fulfilled as Jesus was buried in the tomb of a wealthy man. But also we see the triumph of the cross and the resurrection prophesied as well. Isaiah says, though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he will see his offspring and prolong his days and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. Psalm 22, after giving a description of the crucifixion, goes on to a note of triumph, saying, My praise shall be of thee in the great congregation. Zechariah writes, They will look on him whom they have pierced. Many of these prophecies are quite specific. And while some of them could be orchestrated by a fanatical fraudster who had a good grasp of scriptures, and wanted to pretend to be the Messiah even to death. Many could not be orchestrated in that way because they depended on circumstances and events beyond the control of an individual. The second point to note about prophecy is that many of the ceremonies that were carried out by the Jewish people in the Bible, in the Old Testament, were ceremonies that foretold the character, the life, the death and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. 
An example of this is the Passover festival still observed by Jewish people to this day. In the past, a lamb was sacrificed as a reminder of their deliverance from Egypt and of their sin being covered. John the Baptist pointed to Jesus and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus also said, Search the scriptures, for they speak of me, and so they do. In addition to these prophecies, Jesus himself foretold his death and resurrection. On several occasions, he warned his disciples of what was going to happen. He said, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed, and after three days rise again. And there are other references like that in other Gospels. So we have the evidence of the Scriptures. We have evidence of prophecy. The second piece of evidence that Paul brings to us are the eyewitness accounts of the resurrected Christ. He said Christ Jesus appeared to the disciples, then to others, and finally to 500 people at the same time. And Paul goes on to say most of them are still alive, although some have fallen asleep. He almost invites his, reader, his listeners, his readers, to go and talk to them, speak to them, and they will tell you how they saw Christ dead, buried, and resurrected from the dead. Now, these people, or some of them at least, wrote down their eyewitness accounts in what we call the New Testament. But I suppose this begs the question, how do we know that the New Testament is reliable? How do we know that its writers wrote the truth? People who study ancient manuscripts have a number of tests they place on them to check their accuracy or authenticity. And these are how close in a, uh, are the manuscripts to the actual events? How many copies of the manuscripts exist? How widespread are they across the globe? And how do they differ from each other? And they also look at the writer, the author. How reliable were the authors? How could they have known? How close were they to the events that occurred? If we judge the Bible by these standards, they are the best attested of ancient documents. Here's a quote from Professor Gary Habermas. There is more manuscript evidence for the New Testament from a far earlier period than any other classical work. And there is no fundamental difference between the copies. Any variations are of a minor manner and due to the result of a mistranslation or a miscopy and are quite clear. In addition to these ancient manuscripts and fragments of manuscripts, we have many letters written by the early church fathers. And in these letters, they quote the Bible. And these quotations are the same as we read in our Bibles today. Well, you might say that begs another question. The manuscript might be uh, ancient and accurate, but did the writers record the truth? Did they actually fabricate it, try to make up some story? In response, I would say to that, read their words. Their attitudes and their character shines through their writings and demonstrates them to be men of integrity. And what did they have to gain from such a falsehood? Many of them were persecuted and martyred for their faith, but never recanted their belief in the Lord Jesus Christ or deny what they had witnessed. Paul approaching death could say that he had fought a good fight and there was laid up for him a crown of glory. Peter, in the same situation, could say, we did not follow cleverly invented stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses to his majesty. He's thinking of the day when, in the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus glowed with light and they heard the voice of God. He goes on to say, For we, he received, that's Jesus, received honour and glory from God the Father, when the voice came to him from the majestic glory, saying, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Then Peter adds this, We ourselves heard this voice. 
These men wrote the truth they had witnessed and recorded the words they had heard Jesus say. But I believe many people today reject the word of God, don't believe the Bible, because it contains miracles. If you took the miracles out, most people wouldn't have any problem with the Bible and what it says. They would accept its accuracy. And yet, wouldn't a book about God coming into this world to intervene in it, wouldn't that book be strange if there were no miracles contained within it? So we have the evidence of prophecy, scriptures, and the recorded evidence of eyewitnesses. Finally, the third piece of evidence that Paul presents is his own experience. And he says, he appeared to me. Paul describes himself as a Pharisee of the Pharisees. Now, the Pharisees were a religious sect, a very strict sect, many of whom sought the death of Jesus and tried to stamp out the early church. And Paul, or Saul as he was known in these days, was one of them. He persecuted the early church and was party to the killing of Stephen, the first Christian martyr. Fanatically, he opposed the church and had Christians arrested and imprisoned. And yet I believe something was troubling Paul through this. I am speculating here, but as he arrested Christians, I'm sure he would hear their defense. He would hear them tell how they believed the Lord Jesus fulfilled prophecy. He would hear them talk of the miracles they had seen. He would hear them talk of seeing him after he was resurrected from the dead. Indeed, he might have heard that from some of his fellow Pharisees. Because remember, they accused Jesus of performing the miracles. They couldn't deny them. But they said he performed them through Satan, not God. So perhaps Paul had heard from various sources about what the Lord Jesus had done. And I think he was a, a troubled man. And he was conflicted by what he had heard. And then one day on the road to Damascus, a light shone from heaven. He was thrown down and he heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And the voice went on to say, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. How it must have seared into his soul to hear that that he'd been wrong all this time. And Saul, who, or Paul as we know him, who had been blinded by light, is taken to a street in Damascus called Straight Street, which is still there to this day. And there he had a vision of a man called Ananias coming to give him his sight back. Elsewhere in the city, a man called Ananias is being prompted by the Lord to go to Saul, Paul, and give him his eyesight back. Paul recounts this story on two occasions and each time the light gets brighter and the glory gets greater as he thinks of what had happened to him and the intervention that had come into his life. Paul gave up the prospect of becoming a leader in the Jewish nation. And what did he gain? Well, we read about it earlier, didn't we? Three times beaten with rods, once pelted with stones, three times shipwrecked, a day and night at open sea. And history tells us he was executed in Rome during the reign of the Emperor Nero. Was it worth it? Paul says, all I gave up, I count but loss compared to what I have found in Christ. Paul saw prophecy fulfilled. He knew the eyewitnesses to Jesus' death and resurrection. He knew the faithfulness even unto death. And he had met with the living Lord Jesus. He did not need to have the resurrection of Jesus proved to him. He had met with his Saviour. He was changed and nothing would be the same again. And he says, I know the one in whom I trust. I'm sure he's able to guard what I have entrusted to him against his return. Note, Paul doesn't say, I know what I have believed, but whom he has believed. His faith is in a person. It's in the living Christ, in his power, presence, and in the promises of one who cannot lie. Some people might say, well, people were more gullible 2,000 years ago. In fact, Greek culture was very advanced scientifically and philosophically. The point I'm making is that 
People were required to be convinced then, as they are today, but the church grew. And it grew because people believed the message and the hope that it brought to them. They believed in the integrity of those who brought that message to them and proclaimed it. But above all, they believed because the Holy Spirit revealed the truth to them. And that's the same today. Today we can know the scriptures, we can see the evidence of scriptures and its prophecy. We can read of the eyewitness accounts of these trustworthy people who brought the gospel message to us through the Bible. But what gives us trust and faith is a living encounter with the Lord Jesus. When through the Holy Spirit we are directed to him, he reveals himself to him and we put our first trust and faith in him. Amen. May God bless these words to us. Shall we pray? Our God and Heavenly Father, we come into your presence again and we thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you for the scripture that tells us of the Lord Jesus, for these faithful men and women who proclaimed the gospel in the early church and down through the years until we hear it today. Lord, we come before you and thank you for the day when we came to know the Lord Jesus and put our trust and our faith in him. And so we seek your blessing, Lord, on our world and on our communities. And we pray that you will remain with us during this week. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're now going to hear a final hymn that tells us of uh, God's love and praises the Lord for all he has done for us. We hope to see you next week, God willing, and look forward to being with you again. Amazing grace, amazing grace That far outweighs my past mistakes Your death became the death of shame I'll praise you for amazing grace Up from the grave, up from the grave Into the dark, you called my name And brought me back to life again I rose with you up from the grave
Yes, we. Are. 